Hi everyone and welcome to the Growth Hacking with Influencer Marketing webinar brought to you by OpenView and Tap Influence. Before we kick things off, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. We have an on-demand version of this webinar that everyone will have access to. If you have any questions, please type them in the pane. We'll get to them at the um, end of the webinar. And of course, we would love for you to tweet. Please use hashtag tap in, and you can follow Tap Influence at, at, at Tap Influence and OpenView at OpenView Venture. At the bottom of each slide, you'll see these, uh, these hashtags. And just a little um, extra treat, for those who use the hashtag tap in, the people who use it the most, you'll receive Tap Influence swag. So tweet away. So, um, I'd like to do an introduction of our presenters, and I'll start with Kyle. Kyle is responsible for building content and marketing strategy around all things OpenView. Prior to joining OpenView, Kyle led the global content marketing team for Exact Target and the Salesforce Marketing Cloud. His team managed the creation of content in six countries with over 15 million in pipe, in pipe for a quarter. He authored three books, Twitter Marketing for Dummies, Branding Yourself, and Social CMR for Dummies. You can follow him at Kyle P. Lacey. Next, our second presenter is Joseph Cole. Joseph is an established startup and inbound marketer who oversees brands, marketing, and strategy at Tap Influence. He has a valuable blend of knowledge and practical team building achieved remarkable results while helping grow the company's culture and learning curiosity. He reformed gamification, he's a reformed gamification guy, Agman. Joseph worked on award-winning campaigns for Microsoft, SAP, Cisco, and more. In case you're wondering, for, wondering from his profile picture, he's pretty much addicted to Africa and of course growth marketing. You can follow him at Joe F. Cole. So it's my pleasure to hand over the keys to our presenter, Kyle. Over to you. Thanks, Becca. And uh, much like Joseph is addicted to Africa, I think that's what we said, um, I'm definitely addicted to trying to figure out the customer journey. And a lot of times, um, well, I'll start back. When Becca said that I work for a venture capital firm called OpenView, and I also worked for a company called Exact Target, where we we're the largest email service provider in the world. We sent billions upon billions upon billions of email and digital communications out to consumers for brands. And through that and what we did as a content team and as a company is spend thousands of man hours doing research on customer trends, consumer trends, and marketers' behavior. And through that, the one thing that we really learned overall is that as much as we would like the customer journey to be nonlinear, it's just not. And I think that it is shown through any type of story that you can think of of a consumer buying a product. I have my own stories. You know, I'm obsessed with Amazon's mobile app. And I just had a child named Caden. He's eight months old. I probably should have put a picture up here of him because then that would take away from my voice and you would say, oh, the kid's so cute. But – most of the time when we buy from Amazon, it's when my wife and I are walking with Caden and trying to figure out or stressing out mainly because we're first time parents and trying to figure out how to keep this kid alive and happy and all that type of stuff. And the one thing that I've noticed is that especially when we're trying to figure out what to get Caden, whether that's a shirt or food or anything, it literally takes me three steps on my phone to order something that's delivered to my house within 24 hours. And the reason I tell that story is because there's one overall truth through all this. The customer journey is different for everybody. And the whole point is that a customer, no matter what you're selling, no matter what you're trying to um, buy, a customer is a consumer first overall. And because of that, we are being trained by brands like Apple, Google, Amazon, 
We are being transformed in the way we buy, the way we buy things and products. And we cannot be more off when it comes to how we go about buying certain things, whether that's an accounting firm or it's software. They are training us. Amazon spent $13.3 billion in R&D last year. And that's completely transforming the way we buy and sell products and services. So in order to survive, any brand needs to truly make an experience that matters. Because it doesn't matter if you're a social media manager, a CEO, a marketer, a leader of anything. The only thing that makes us relevant is the experience the consumer has with our brand. And if the experience is broken, or it takes me seven steps to get something, or if I don't feel like you're actually telling a great story, you're going to lose. And when marketers, I, I, well, I know as a marketer, I'm sure Joseph knows this as well, we're getting 200 million pieces of content a minute. People are creating content all over the place. Most, most of it's crap, but at least we're getting a lot of content. And it's completely transforming the way we buy. And the thing about that is, is that in order for us to survive, we have to figure out how to make the experience better. Unfortunately for most of us, and I'm, I'm also to blame in this, we do the exact opposite of making the experience great, which is basically buy more ads. And honestly, this is probably one of the better quotes that I've ever read about this. Nobody reads ads. People read what interests them. Sometimes it's an ad. And honestly, we know that stories sell. Stories are the best marketing you could possibly create. And as we try to scale and as we buy more ads, all we're doing is building a wall around the people who are trying to communicate with us. We overcompensate because we can't figure out really what to do in order to get more money for our brand. And that's where ad blocking comes in, which is exponential growth of ad blocking. I'm pretty sure that most of us has, have at least looked at it. As of June 2015, there were 198 million, let me say that one more time, and this was a year ago, so I can't imagine what it is now, 198 million monthly active users for the major browser extensions that block ads. So there's lots of reasons that this is happening, right? The content is irrelevant. People don't care. Your marketing messages are hitting a wall because we're not truly trying to make the experience as relevant as possible. And frankly, ad blocking or ads, I'm sorry, are annoying, right? Most of them. There's a lot of reasons why people are using ad blockers, you know, whether that's bandwidth or privacy, you know, the cookie tracking. Um, they think they're annoying and, or they're trying to remove as many as possible. It's completely ruining the experience. And it's time for us to step up as marketers and find different strategies and different ways to reach people and of relevance. So that comes to growth hacking for influencer marketing, which is a part of this um, webinar, which then I'm going to hand over to Joseph. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Um, and it, it really does showcase that, you know, marketers, we are um, our own worst enemy. You know, the more we, we see how um, ad block is hurting us, it, we, there's a tendency to um, spend more and more into, um, you know, uh, ads and really just creating a lot of noise. And so in light of these barriers, uh, there, there, to me as a growth marketer, there's a constant quest to hack brand growth, right? You know, how do you get around um, ad block? How do you get around and really cut through the noise and get in front of uh, the your target market? And so it's about finding that feasible solution. And as Kyle shared, it's the rise of ad blocking and the change in these social algorithms that's making it harder and harder for us marketers to really be in front of you know the people who matter. And so growth hacking naturally is a new way to exist, especially in the fast-paced world of uh, digital marketing. Um, so really to growth hack, you have to be creative, you have to be analytical, and you have to live in social metrics. And the good thing is, at least with influence marketing, influencers are socially, you know, it, it is inherently social. 
And, you know, one thing I actually forgot to say is, you know, throughout this presentation, feel free to ask questions, and there's a questions panel here, so, um, you know, we want to make it as conversational as possible, so, you know, Kyle and myself will be here to, um, you know, answer the questions that come along the way. So, if we move to the next slide here, uh, this, this here is something that I think is quite important to remember, is, is in light of ag block and algorithms, what's missing is the human aspect. And to grow tech, it requires creativity. And the creative part still uh, needs to come from you, or the influencer, or ideally uh, a collaboration of both. So both the influencer and, and the marketer, and not, not to stifle the influencer's creativity, because that's where you lose the, the authenticity. Um, so you know, basically, if, if we aren't able to you know, really focus on the human aspect, um, you know, we, they're going to block us. And we have to change we, the way that we interact with the consumer. Otherwise, again, you know, they will block us. So enter growth hacking for influence marketing. So before we really get into you know, the growth hacking methodology, I, I think it's important that we really clear up what exactly is an influencer. There's a lot of confusion um, there, so hopefully I'll be able to provide some examples so that we're all clear on, on how to you know, approach this. So influence isn't necessarily a celebrity endorsement, and that's probably the biggest misconception. And then it's also not free publicity through advocates. So, for example, celebs, they have influence, no doubt, right? You know, they're a celebrity. Of course, they're going to be influential. But influencers have influence because of the content they create. It's influential because it resonates with your audience. That's probably one of the biggest difference. And one practical example of late, I'd say, is if you think about uh, the Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie breakup, terrible news, well, <laughs> no, I'm not sure there, but uh, it's also affectionately known as the Brangelina exit. So, for example, if you were to take Angelina and she were to endorse content, the topic of conversation would likely be around the, the separation rather than the brand or the story that they're trying to convey. And again, influencers are influential because the content they create is, is, is important, and it's about their subject matter expertise on that product, on their topic, or of that service that actually creates the influence. So basically, influencers, they, they bridge the gap to talk to consumers naturally. In fact, Google discovered that Gen Y is 40% more likely to buy a product based on a true influencer's recommendation. So not necessarily Angelina Jolie or Kim Kardashian, rather it's uh, an influencer who is, you know, popularity based on the content that they're creating around, you know, whatever the, the, the product is, for example, would be a makeup, a car, um, a, a service. So the thing is, people relate to social media influencers, and that's because of the authenticity. Is that just like us, brands aren't people, influencers are people, and the interaction is two-way. And influencer marketing feels more like a peer recommendation, and it's really the capitalization of that word of mouth and being able to cultivate it. And that's why it's so important for growth hacking. So if we get into the, the details, well, what is a hack? And if you're a competitive person like me, you should think about those roadblocks that Kyle mentioned earlier, um, ad block and the algorithms with Facebook and Instagram and what have you, is you really have to look at those as an opportunity to get ahead of your competitors. So what is that hat exactly, hack exactly? It, and this here is a model that I think really simplifies it nicely. It's by another growth marketer. Her name's Christy Sharman. And it's super simple. And basically, it's finding the quickest, most effective way to go from the bottom of the triangle to the top. You know, the bottom is where you, the brand, are talking about, you know, about your services to getting and graduating to the top of the triangle where influencers are talking about your brand to where other people are talking about your brand. So as you move up this triangle, um, influence obviously increases. Other people talking about your brand has a lot more power to influence uh, consumers than you do. So it's about moving from traditional and expensive advertising, hence ad block, making it even more expensive for cost per lead, cost per MQL, uh, to where other people are talking about your brand and you're not having to worry about those social algorithms. That concept uh, is, is really simple, and this is really how we get in, into the hack specifically. So how do you move from the bottom of the triangle to the top? And this is part one. So like any good marketer, you need to think about your end goal. 
in mind. Well, actually, what you should be thinking about is what your end user's goal is. And I recommend that you go through a, the traditional persona e exercise, of course, but take it one step further. And it's going through a more personal persona exercise. And that's understanding, you know, what are the hopes and desires? Um, you know, what are the stresses or the things that keep people up at night? Um, and as far as your end user, what is the media that they consume? Um, where is it that they go? And then also understanding what it is that they like to do in their free time. Part one is important because it actually helps you contextualize that bridge and, and bridges that gap to part two, which is listed here. And that's about understanding how the influencer fits into your buyer's journey and what's most important at each phase of the buyer's journey. That general mindset is going from awareness, consideration, decision, decision, and within those phases, mapping content and behaviors that actually address the specific persona pain points. Sorry, I went a little crazy on the slides and there was a delay there, but um, so the goal here is understanding the specific pain points per phase. And that's where you layer in the influencer marketing or the influencer to accelerate the buyer's journey. And it doesn't matter whether you're B2B or B2C, it's about the context is really the content is really the same, it's about being human. So for example, and within the convert stage here, you want to identify the influencers who are the and these are the voices that your end user trusts and then share content that actually highlights the pain point. So part three is, now that you understand the end user's goal and how influencers fit into that journey, you have to codify that influence marketing process. That is, how do I execute this? So where you want to start here is with reach. Start with a clear definition of your ideal customer. Then look at the influencer's ability to reach and influence that customer using real data about the influencer's actual audience composition. And that would include things like location, gender, age, income, brand affinities, and interests, as well as personality traits. The next part of this you want to discover, you know, and, and remember here is the influencer isn't the audience. You want to shift away from actually relying upon the influencer's characteristics to identify them towards the, the union of the audience. So basically what you want to make sure here is that, um, that the influencers that you're reaching out to, are they actually uh, you know, having that conversation with, with your persona? The next step here is monitoring, and it's all about content, and that's having the right content. And what you have to remember is influencers are influential again because of the content that they create. You want to understand what, what the reach is, what is the engagement, and which channels. And the biggest thing here, what you want to ensure is that you're collaborating with the influencer to create content. And the reason that they are influential again is that their content is, is, is recognized for the, the expertise. And the last thing that you want to do here is measure. And just like any marketing campaign, you want to look at the ROI or the CP, which is cost per engagement, uh, the actual engagement and the sentiment around um, the content that the influencer is making on your behalf. Sorry, there's a little delay here, but um, here we are. So part four, I, there was a lot that I went through in, in that methodology in terms of how we growth hack with influence marketing. But here's a starter kit that you can download, and we actually have an attachment link here that you can get it directly. And so there are three different um, worksheets in here that you can use to start your influencer marketing campaign. So the first one actually goes through some of the slides that I went over, and that's about outlining the buyer's journey and the types of content that you would map at each stage. The second worksheet within this is uh, how to select the right influencers, making sure that you know, you're not using the influencer as the actual target audience, that you're not getting those confused. Rather, you're ensuring that these influencers can reach the target. And then the influencer marketing creative brief, so you can actually write out the assignment and understand how to craft your influencer marketing campaign, uh, whether that's a blog, whether that's a social media post, whether it's a, you know, a, a, a collective of multiple different marketing um, channels. So the, the thing here is you know, there's a lot that you'd need to do in terms of growth hacking uh, with, with influencer marketing. And so I've summarized a lot of this here, but I'd say for the sake of time, um, the biggest thing to consider here is what is that value equation? And so what you want to ensure in all your influence marketing campaigns is that obviously everyone wins, 
And the thing is to consider the brand. The brand wins because the campaign meets business objectives and you can find out all of this information in the, um, the worksheets that we're sharing. Uh, the influencer wins because they're proud of the content that they, and they're happy to post it. And then the audience wins because they actually enjoy the content that they're receiving from the influencer. They actually want to hear from the influencer. And so that addresses a lot of the, the issues and the, the barriers that we discussed earlier, uh, whether that is ad block or, um, or the algorithms that you know, Facebook and Google constantly change. So one of the biggest things or one of the biggest takeaways that you know, I hope that everyone will take in, in, into consideration here is that social influencers came into existence because they're really incredible at what they're doing. Um, and, and it's what brands struggle to do every day. And that's finding a way through all those roadblocks to create content that consumers actually want to engage with. So getting started is sometimes really hard. And remember, again, you can download those worksheets, uh, but to actually execute you can go about it in a few different ways. Uh, you can use a platform like Tap Influence, for example, where the vetting process for influencers, their assignments, the management, the legal, the FTC regulations, payment, um, the ROI and data analysis is all in one place. Uh, that's probably the easiest place that I'd recommend that people start with an influencer marketing campaign, but, and I'd obviously recommend that. But if you need to kind of do it yourself, um, the, the biggest challenge I'd say is finding the right influencers, making sure that the influencers actually re the in reach the intended audience. So there are a collection of different tools that you can use from Moz to BuzzSumo to Twitter, et cetera. It's more of a manual process where you'll need to go out and vet and find um, the right influencers by using different hashtags and then you know engaging with them. But that said, you know, I've given a few different tips on this slide uh, to help you start a meaningful relationship with influencers so they can actually begin an, an influence marketing campaign. So, you know, for example, you might want to reach out to a specific influencer once you've identified your end user pain points and identified that they actually reach your target or your intended audience by doing some unsolicited reviews, commenting on their posts or giving them your best content that they can post on your behalf that obviously relates and adds value to their audience as well. And then also sending customers. Um, obviously this will take a lot more time than using a, an existing platform, but it's definitely an easy way to start. Um, so again, you'll have access to this and be able to kind of look at what those different tips are for reaching out to influencers and creating a meaningful relationship. So without influence, your, your content doesn't gain any traction, and that, that goes without saying. And what we're seeing is now is, is that influence marketing definitely spreads the divide between B2B and B2C. It's, it's all about H2H. -to -H. And what we're saying, seeing here at uh, Tap Influence is actually an emergence of B2B marketers using influence marketing to, to grow their business. So, Kyle, I, I'd like to hand it over to you and see get your perspective on um, influence marketing and uh, the B2B landscape. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we talked about it at the beginning, and we've talked about it through this entire presentation, and, and it's really that B2B, B2C, B2C to B2B to B2C to B, right? What, however we want to describe it, the paths the pass to purchase are converging, right? I. It's really hard for me as somebody who has been in software, who has been in consumer, who has, who has now, who's now looking outside of that venture capital. It's really hard for me to say that there's a difference other than maybe the sales cycle of certain things. Um, it's, it's influencer marketing in general, which Joseph has talked about, is very much as much for B2B as it is for B2C because we're all trying to reach humans. So, I mean, smart marketers in the B2B world, in the software world, in my world, they're already testing the waters and asking questions about how it might work. And there's a couple things that you guys need to take into account, especially those of you in the B2B world, in especially the software world. There's sites like G2 Crowd that are pulling in tons of reviews on software. It, the peer-based development of whether or not I should buy something I go to my peers and ask them, what are they using? You know, from a B2B, you know, coming from the software world, if I'm trying to figure out what to use in my marketing stack, I'll email Joseph and ask him, what are you using? 
because I trust Joseph. And so it's really important to take into account that you can find these influencers, you know, using system, using products like Tap Influence, frankly, and also going to events and keeping in mind who who has the loudest voice, even though sometimes the loudest voice isn't the best voice, but who is actually influencing people at these events and bringing them into the fold. And sometimes in the B2B world, your customer is the biggest influencer. If you look at major software players like Salesforce, their MVPs, Salesforce MVPs, are crazy influencers, like insane influencers, because they believe in the brand, they believe in the experience, they have been taught and trained to be influencers, and despite the fact that they might not be Kardashian with 10 billion Instagram followers, they are Steve in Wyoming that knows 30 people that will all make a purchase decision based off of Steve's opinion. And it's up to us as marketers to figure out how to actually bridge that gap from a brand to influencer marketing. And so a couple of things to take into account, which we kind of talked about with Steve as micro um, influencers are really how, how do we backing up? How do we drive B2B influencer marketing? Um, first one, of course, is micro influencers. In my opinion, from the B2B side, micro-influencers are people that might not have massive followings, but have loyal followings, that believe in your brand, but have the ability to make huge impact with the people that follow them. The rise, basically the rise of micro-influencers and social and digital has allowed us to be able all to become micro-influencers if we want to. So figuring out how and who to work with to do B2B influencer marketing effectively and authentically will be a challenge for many of you, but micro-influencers can help with that. There's just few voices in software as, or I'm, I'm sorry, in B2B as much as in um, consumers. And then, of course, there's always measurement, and then there's always the human journey, which we talked about earlier when I told the story about using the Amazon app. Um, there isn't a difference between professional and personal. Uh, the way that I buy something on Amazon is the same way I'm going to buy a piece of software, frankly. You know, if it takes me three or four clicks to get to a phone number and I can't click your phone number to make a call, now this is getting a little bit off topic, but I'm more on the soapbox. The journey's broken. And so how do we take, how do we include people into the journey to sell something? Um, to their, the people that they influence. And especially when measurement, if we go to the third one or the middle one, I kind of skipped over that, but measurement, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on digital measurement. Um, ultimately, it's about driving the unit economics of your business. And sometimes digital strategy does not do that. And so it's a matter of how do you create influence in order to drive the important numbers of your business for ultimate growth. So the question is, will it be commonplace for B2B especially? Will influencer marketing be commonplace by the end of next year? Um, I, I don't know. I would hope so. I feel like a lot of us are doing this already. Um, we just need to get better at doing it. And the success of any marketing strategy, I don't care if it's influencer marketing or content or any channel that you're using, it's really about two things. It's the P or three things. It's the people, the process, and the performance. And if you manage those effectively, you'll be able to get the reach and the relevance and ultimately the resonance around your brand that will really drive rewards. And rewards meaning money and sales because that's what drives our growth and that's what helps us scale. It's going to spread, it's going to connect B2B to B2C, but it is something that has to be in every marketer's toolbox because it's important to what we do. And I think it is an ultimate transition that has to happen as the world becomes so noisy and as it becomes even more noisy than what it is now. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Joseph. 
Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, we actually got a few questions that um, from the audience. So if you guys have any, again, there's the questions panel there, and uh, Becca's going to um, go through some of these that pertain to, to both of us, Kyle. So um, we'll um, let Becca take that part for us. Yeah, so great webinar. Thank you, you guys. Very informative. I'm just going to start with a very simple question. You can receive the buyer's journey sheets within the attachment of the webinar. So in case you're looking for that, it's right there. Um, so the first question. At what point in scaling um, your marketing efforts? Sorry, one second. Let me just move forward. At one point in scaling your marketing efforts, do you begin to sacrifice the relationship building aspect and relevancy of your influencer audience? For example, some campaigns and message, same campaign and message from 20 influencers, as opposed to 20 different campaigns tailored to each influencer. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Kyle, did you want to jump in there? Otherwise, I, I, I have a few ideas. No, you, and, um, you, uh, you, you, you go <laughs> first. I'll, I'll, I'll add on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's key here. You know, it's the relationship building aspect that is, is important. Um, obviously, when you, you use a platform like TAP, these have been opt-in influencers, so they want to work with the brands. Um, and so there is a natural affinity that they have to, you know, with some of the assignments they, that they get. Um, in terms of relevancy, we, we've done a lot of research around that, and I think it really speaks to what Kyle was saying earlier, and that's around micro-influencers. And um, the thing with micro-influencers, they might not necessarily have the biggest audience. Um, they might actually have a small, you know, quite a small audience. However, the effectiveness of the message has been shown to be a lot uh, more powerful than, say, you know, for example, uh, Kim Kardashian, who you know isn't really an influencer, but has, as Kyle was saying, tens of millions of uh, Instagram followers. That if they were to share something, or she were to share something, the impact of her message isn't necessarily authentic, and then also the actual reach and the effectiveness of it doesn't really. Um, it doesn't really have the same impact as a uh, as a micro influencer. Now there, there was a question here around some campaign and message from 20 influencers as opposed to 20 different campaigns tailored to each influencer. I think the key here is being specific. Um, and if you think about the buyer's journey and you're thinking about that uh, that process that I went through, you want to make sure that the influencer is able to reach the intended audience, that you're probably going to have a lot more effectiveness by starting small and then you know spreading it out. Just like any test and learn campaign, you want to understand what message actually resonates and um, wins. Then you start, you know, diversifying and you know um, putting a more investment in different uh, channels. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Kyle, any yeah, I think, thoughts there? Yeah, I, well, I think it's important to also remember that influencers are also customers and consumers. So, I, you know, I think that tailoring messages as much as you can to each specific person is good. Um, and it's a matter of how how are you using content and tech to scale that. But, you know, we all want to feel special and influencers want to feel special as well. So it's really a matter of, um, as Joseph said, starting small and then trying to figure out how to tailor it for sure. Yeah. And also related to that, I, I think it was today someone shared a note with me about um, uh, Facebook where, um, you know, now people, brands used to be able to boost posts directly from their Facebook page and um, it wouldn't be perceived as an ad. <laughs> now they have to be, now they now that's taken away, they actually um, are an ad. And so I guess why I'm sharing this is that um, the influencer, if you're targeted enough and you understand the influencer's audience and you understand the influencer, you're going to have a much bigger effect than say, you know, this mass message. Terrific. Okay, now the questions are really starting to flow in. So we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. In terms of retail consumer products, any specific recommendation in the selection of influencers? Is it different than IT B2B? If I'm launching a new product, how is the engagement different than the product already in the market? That's a great question again. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of retail consumer products, any specific recommendation in the selection of influencers? Yeah, so 
you, again, it's you know the, that model about how to identify the right influencer. First, you have to understand, like any marketing campaign, is understand the persona, and then also understand the reach. Like, does that influencer actually reach your intended audience? And I'd say there isn't necessarily a difference between B2B and B2C from that perspective. It's all about making sure that the influencer that you're you're trying to find is is or you know trying to use for this marketing campaign actually has influence over your intended audience. Now the other one here is it says if I'm launching a new product, how is the engagement? Oops, where did it go? How is the engagement different than a product already in the market? I think influencers can actually, because what we spoke about before um, around uh, ad block and algorithms within social, I think leveraging influencer marketing is pretty key in terms of cutting through the noise. Um, it, and the reason for that, it provides a lot more authenticity where the reach is actually going to be um, you know, received by uh, the intended audience a lot better than, say, um, you know, than it would be where there isn't any understanding of what that product is. So I'd argue that um, influencer marketing can probably help amplify the launch of a new product um, even more so. Kyle? No, you you got it, man. I have nothing, I have nothing more to add on that. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next one. Given the power of trusted content from influencers, is it worth spending any marketing funds whatsoever on solutions like retargeting? Can you use them to promote trusted content from influencers? Yeah, um, so I would say when you think about influencer marketing campaign, you should look at it as an integrated marketing campaign and understand um, what other avenues can help amplify the content that you're getting an influencer to create. So, for example, I wouldn't do retargeting in isolation of doing, say, for example, Google AdWords or pay-per-click, right? Um, so, uh, in order to, you know, create the maximum effect from influencer marketing, I usually like to couple it, or the team here usually likes to couple it with other marketing initiatives. Um, that said, there, um, you know, influencer marketing is, you know, powerful on its own. But you know, it's it, it's also a great tool to actually use within existing marketing campaigns to actually amplify what you're already doing. Kyle, do you have anything to add to that? No, Joseph's on a roll here. I, okay. I just think, I think okay. that the, All right. so I think that the sorry, go ahead. I think that the dip. You know, you don't want. If you're gonna, if you're gonna really, if influencers truly believe in what you're doing, they're gonna get the reach. I, I honestly, I don't think I would spend money on top of that pushing the content. Um, I would have different strategies to push the content outside of the influencer, but not directly related. Exactly, and one thing to add there, I think it's important if you're if you're running an influencer marketing campaign. Um, internally, you should create evangelism around it. So, for example, if the influencer is writing a blog post or creating an ebook on behalf of a, of a product launch, um, the, you should try to rally the troops with, within your team to also like and share that content as well. Um, there are a lot of times and situations where we have clients who run influencer marketing campaigns, but they don't actually, you know, get the the team behind it to really help create success for it. Um, so that's one thing that I'll probably say is important as you think about how to promote and boost your campaigns. Okay, terrific. Um, so I'm really loving these next two questions because we definitely have the content to support this. Uh, the first question is, do you guys have any stats on influencer marketing ROI for specific industries? Influencers have become so expensive. Is there any way I can estimate what my ROI will be for a particular influence or influencer or campaign? Yeah, for the second part, I'd say that really depends, and it depends for a few reasons. Uh, different influencers have different rates, right? Um, so that's going to impact the cost and also impact the ROI. But we do have ROI for specific industries, at least for the market influence marketing campaigns that we've run. Um, we did run a campaign with uh, Nielsen Catalina Solutions where we were able to prove an 11 times ROI on uh, when compared to traditional um, advertising. 
So um, what we did is we did a you know side by side study, uh, looked at the looked at a campaign um, without influencer marketing versus with a campaign uh, that did use influencers. And so the campaign that used influencers had two two results. One was the 11 times ROI. The second was that the content actually became evergreen, where it kept on producing results and engagement even after they had stopped spending anything on it. So there's that longevity behind um, uh, behind what we've seen. So uh, what we can do is uh, send um, everyone here some research and um, some of the data points as well as the methodology associated with some of these studies. Kyle, anything on that? No, oh, that's all you guys. Okay, <laughs> terrific. Um, okay, so the next question is, from a practical perspective, how can you provide an example of an SMB startup or otherwise to use the influencer market? In other words, how would they go about getting there? What is the first, second, third, and all reactive steps? Yeah, Kyle, you know, given this is the SMB startup world and being an open open view, um, wonder if you have any, you know, specific thoughts around, um, you know, how SMBs can take advantage of um, influencer marketing. Yeah, I think that what's important, which I failed to mention during the webinar, is that it's really important that SMBs and startups and B2B and anything that we're talking about, honestly, gets their personas right first, their buyer personas. And I think you mentioned that during the talk, Joseph, just about understanding your buyer, truly understanding your buyer so you can find the right influencers. So I think overall, that's, that's the number one step. Do you truly have personas that, that make sense? Because a lot of times um, companies, especially SMBs, to no fault of their own, don't spend a lot of time really trying to understand that. And that's, and that's using quantitative as well as qualitative type means in order to figure that out. So number one is truly understanding the buyer. Number two is creating a list of the influencers that, that, that actually uh, are the people that actually influence those buyers that you spent time and energy on trying to figure out and creating a list of those people in order for you to figure out then how to reach out to them and get them um, to influence. And so, you know, I'll, I'll use OpenView as an example. We're a venture capital firm, but we do influencer marketing as well. Our network is very important to us because the people who are on boards and who are advisors and who have built and sold companies, they are influencers just as much as anything else. And so when we know who we're trying to sell to, when we know who those influencers are, we try to get them to experience OpenView in different ways, whether that's an event or meeting a partner or um, receiving something in the mail, like a direct mail piece, frankly or coming into the office and meeting a bunch of people or setting in on an investment call. Like we're constantly trying to get people involved in the brand so that they believe in what we do so that they can become an influencer of what we do. Um, so we're truly understanding the buyer. I think is number one, the second thing is, is actually understanding who the influencers are and creating a list of targets for lack of better term. And then, building experiences around those targets in order to get them to be involved in the brand or believe in the brand. And I'm sure that Joseph has stuff to add on to that. Yeah, I think it actually segues into another question that someone asked, and it was related to how does influencer marketing fit into a large media campaign or really just into any marketing campaign. So I think that's especially important for the SMB and startup world is that obviously you have to be a little more frugal in terms of you know how and where you allocate your funds and understanding how to create your influencer marketing campaign. And I think it's it's what Kyle said. It's really understanding um, you know the the persona and the exercise that I went through. It's something that um, I I worked on. I worked in gamification prior to influencer marketing where in order to truly understand how to resonate with someone, it's really about understanding, um, you, know, the, you know, their hopes and desires. What are the things that keep them up at night? Like, what are the things that actually really stress someone? Um, how is it that they, that they consume media? You know, are they on Facebook? Do they read stuff on Facebook? Probably, right? But it's truly understanding that. And then understanding, um, you know, what is it that they want to do with their free time? And that's particularly important, I think, in influencer marketing is, understanding what people want to do in their free time. Because by virtue of being an influencer, you know, there's a subject matter expertise that 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 
person or the end user you're trying to reach and understanding what they want to do in their free time can actually help you understand what influencer you actually should be reaching out to and how they can play a part of your larger integrated marketing campaign. Um, so when I think about influence marketing and how it fits into larger media campaigns, I think it's like any marketing initiative. You have to think about number one, the persona. Number two, um, you have to think about the effectiveness in terms of um, like what is your budget, how much are you gonna you know invest in that specific campaign, and then measure it. Um, so I, I like to go about influence marketing and think about you know marketing in general from the same perspective of truly it starts from understanding your end user, what are the pain points that they have. Um, and then I think there's one more question here, which is probably a big one, Becca, right, yeah. around um, uh, regulations and as far as what can you do, what you can't do, uh, you know, when you're running an influence marketing campaign, and it's around um, FT the FTC. Um, what, it's an organization which mitigates, you know, um, the ethicalness of advertising, I could say, uh, if I were to summarize. But um, with influence marketing, um, it's important to be authentic. You you should always disclose that it's it's a sponsored content. Um, Kim Kardashian was um, called out for that, where you know she posted stuff on her Instagram page, and then she posted stuff um, on the brand's page on as a on behalf of the brand, but didn't disclose that it was um, an endorsement. Um, so the step to I guess mitigate that number one, if you do use a platform like Tap Influence, all of that is facilitated within the platform. Um, number two, you know, obviously ensure that, you know, if you aren't using a platform like Tap, that you are clear with the expectations and as far as, you know, that you have to, you know, disclose this an ad um, so that the influencer understands what they're supposed to, to, supposed to do. Um, and then if you do make a mistake, um, fix it. You know, I think that's what Kim did, or Kimmy, um, as she went back. She went back and actually, you know, corrected her mistake. And I think people are pretty forgiving, but the, the impact of it is that, you know, it wasn't authentic. And that's the key with influencer marketing. It has to be, it, why it works is because of the authenticity. Terrific. Uh, any, any, Kyle, anything from you on that, or? No. Okay, terrific. So we're going to actually wrap up here. Those were some really great questions that came through. Thank you, everyone, who submitted a question. Uh, we will be following up with the um, on-demand link in addition to an email from, um, yeah, the on-demand link, which is also, but also the attachment of the um, deck as well, which you can also find here, just to make sure you guys understand that it's also within the attachments and links. So um, if you haven't received or if you can't download it, We'll, that we'll be sending out um, as a follow-up from TAP Influence as well. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Joseph. And you'll be hearing from us thank soon. Thank you. Thank you.